Working? Yes. Right. <laughs> Today is Friday, March 10th, 2023, and the time is 1.18. My name is Emma Truscott. I'm a student employee with the RIT Archives. And today I'm interviewing Chris Nackis. This is our second interview in a series of interviews. Um, Chris graduated from the RIT School of Photographic Arts and Sciences in 1983, and we are putting, working on putting together an exhibition of his work. This interview is being conducted in Chris's house in Rochester, New York. And before we get started, can I ask for your verbal consent to record? Yes, you have my permission to record everything that I say. Awesome. All right, so whenever, when we left off from our last interview, we were talking about the end of RIT and everything. Okay. Um, but before we move on, I wanted to ask you about your experience in Austria. Mm -hmm. You just want to tell me a little bit about what that trip entailed? Sure. The, um, do you want me to give you a lot of stuff or do you want me to just to succinctly give you things? Because um, I, I can talk a lot, so it's up to you. If you want me to give you a lot of stuff and you can edit whatever you want to edit, or do you want me to just give you a small little sampling of what? You can give me a small little sampling first, and then I'll ask if I okay. can think of other questions. Sure, sure. The, um, it was our third year of, of, at RIT. There was a program uh, that Salzburg College went through a Northern Illinois University to have kids from the, from the United States, uh, from different colleges of the United States, uh, to go to Salzburg and to stay either a half year or a full year in the program. And one of the programs that they offered was um, uh, fine art, not really photojournalism, but fine art, documentary pho uh, photography. You can shoot what you wanted to shoot. It's for your student to explore their vision, their, you know, their artistic ability in order to understand what type of photography they want to do, uh, and just to experience another, another culture. So we had students uh, from all over the United States, and they would go through Northern Illinois University, and then to Salzburg College. So everything transferred over, except I think it was something like four credit hours or something for, for RIT students, for um, uh, photography students. And for uh, at RIT, it was generally the photography program is what they accepted. You know, you couldn't be like, a, I don't know, an engineer major or something like that. So, um, and then when we came back, we would have to take one course at any time, you know, just to graduate. We decided that summer when we came back to take a course before, <clears throat> so that was 1982, the summer of 82, uh, so we can graduate in 83, um, you know, on time. For me, it was on time because it was right 79 to 83, four years. So it was a, uh, it, it was a program where we learned art history. The art history class was, was very good very good the whole year was art history which is good because that accented photography uh, you know you, you you learned from prehistoric art all the way to modern art and the understanding of different movements and that obviously helped your seeing process you know your your brain developing into uh, you know into a, a visual sense so and then we took German the whole year uh, German classes, so we could, um, so we can obviously communicate, and that was a thing that uh, we, my colleagues and I, wanted to do, or my friends, uh, more than anything uh, outside of the photography, was to learn German and to be able to speak to just normal, common people right. over there. Now, I took German in high school for two years. So I had a little bit of, you know, the grammar when you, when we're taking the classes that became easier for me. And, you know, you, you, in high school, you, yeah, you take German, but you really don't speak it that often. So when we first uh, got in there, it was difficult to, uh, to, to speak to people. But then after a while, uh, going out, we would always go out and we would... Um, do our German classes every day, and we try to converse with anybody. And we were staying with a uh, 
family, and this is a, <laughs> this is a funny thing, but the family that we stayed with, um, they had we would rent. It, uh, we I'm talking about my friend Bob and I, and my other, well the three of us went Bob, Mike, and I. But Mike decided to go some stay with somebody someone else. I can tell you that about that later if you're interested. So we stayed and we didn't and, and the people that were the head of the house they had a, it was called the Gast House or Pension. It was they had a beautiful, beautiful like. Uh, house that they had separated and they rented out rooms to students and to just visitors that are passing by Salzburg you can rent a room out for like two three it's like a bed and breakfast and you, and they would serve a breakfast if you want them you know uh, over there and uh, so we stayed there and that is and where we were I told you about this is off off the record type of thing about my daughter and her place that she was staying in Greece with the island and the Aegean right. and everything that looked nice. Well, ours was similar to that also because our view was, you know, boom, the, uh, if you've seen the um, Sound of Music, is the Utisberg, the big mountain in the back and the pond and everything. So we had a beautiful view also. And on the other side, you had the Alps. So we weren't, uh, <laughs> we weren't suffering as far <laughs> as where we were living in the, uh, in the visual aspect. But... It was it was good because, and we had obviously photography class, and we would have different workshops every month. A different photographer from Europe, from Germany, from Czechos, uh, at that point Czechoslovakia, because it was you know, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, um, Austria, from Vienna. Uh, they would set up different workshops, and we would have to do those workshops. It would be for the whole weekend. It would and other. People from Salzburg, from Austria, from Germany, whoever heard about that workshop, if they were interested in photography, they can participate also. They would have to pay a fee. So we would do that, and it would be a big workshop uh, where we, whatever the, the assignment was given because of whom it was that was teaching the, uh, the workshop, he would have us do it. So we'd work the whole weekend, boom, out shooting, however, and then going to the dark rooms, uh, develop the film develop the the prints and go up and critique everything and then um and that would be part of it and so that that was very good and then, it, and then we would have time for instance uh you have uh, like a recess a week a, i don't know fall recess or something where mm -hmm. you have a week or usually go home and do something where well, we would go to italy we went to Italy down there to do something, and then you know after for for winter break we went by train through Yugoslavia to Greece, and then we flew to Egypt, and then we flew back to Greece, and then I went back to my village. I stayed a week longer than the, um, and we had something like four or five weeks for a winter break, and then my friends left, went back up to Austria, and I stayed a a week longer in the village. That was the first time I ever ever was in Greece, so where my parents grew up, so I stayed in their village. They said I had the house there, I learned how to make a fire and boom, you know, and a, and a wood burning stove. And I stayed there for a week and then I went back to, to Salzburg and we finished off the year. And now halfway through, some students, they left because they were only there for a half year. And then we had a new batch come in for the remaining year for into the spring. Okay. And so, and, and there were field trips like we went to Vienna, so we would photograph Vienna. We went to Innsbruck, and we would photograph that whole thing. And you know, no matter where we went, we the the when we first got there, we would fly uh, in September for the school year. We flew into Belgium, and from Belgium, there was a big uh, bus ride with all the students from the whole school so you, we can get acclimated with one another. And it was like a week going down Germany, going, staying in different cities of Germany until we finally entered Salzburg. And that was just to get accustomed to the, uh, the culture, the people, your students. And, you know, a lot of people were homesick. And, oh, it didn't bother me at all. But some people are emotional like that. So, the, <laughs> so and that was... That was that was a lot of fun. So, and then when we came back 
after the half year was done, then there was another batch of students, and they all came, did the whole thing. So they were a little bit tight knit people at that point, and then they came to our school, and they didn't know us, and then we would have to, uh, you know, obviously get to know them and everything, which is not a big deal. Right. So, right. so were you there for the full full school the whole, year? Yep, the whole okay. year. Awesome. Um, what do you think some, do you feel like you learned more things there photographically than you would have at RIT? Um, that's a good question. And I would say for me, for me, yes. It depends on what type of photography that you are interested in pursuing. Now, if you were, if you wanted to get into some type of professional photography, studio work, uh, magazine type of thing, yeah, no, you really wouldn't. I mean, it would help also because anytime you go somewhere else and you experience a different culture, you learn new things. You know, your mind opens up a little bit more, and you get more creative in your in your being which will hopefully spill over to your work so yeah they can do it but if you're trying to um, to you know master the technique of of lighting strobes tungsten lights back then you had and and learning different angles and how to set your your things up to go into professional photography, studio photography, uh, fashion, or anything like that. Not really, but the type that we, whether you're a photojournalist, which photo, a photojournalist major would have liked it, a fine art major, you know, uh, that would have helped. Um, the type of stuff that obviously I wanted to do was trying to master the, the rectangular frame of the camera. So... Yeah, because it's, uh, you go to Europe, it's a different look. We had different instructors every month in those workshops. So you had a, a, a lot of variety in teaching. Where at RIT, you did have that, but not as much mm -hmm. uh, because of the way the things are structured. And so, and then you just had the topography for the type of stuff we're doing, like I was saying before, you know, you look at things and they're within the frame, you're just looking at objects and how objects fill the frame and how they fit together. Well, those objects in black and white photography, which is what we do, which is what I do, I, that's what I only do, stick with, um, certain things lend themselves better to black and white photography than than other things so like let's say egypt you know that old gritty type of culture uh the people you know the the garb that they wear and everything obviously it it, it lends itself better to photographically in black and white imagery than um than let's say i don't know well Southern Henrietta Institute of Technology, Russian, you know, RIT over there. You know, you have a, a suburban practice. You're always photographing around. Then you, you know, you, it's a different look, and so it doesn't lend itself, I guess, as well as like old world Italy, Greece, Egypt, and then you can contrast that with something a little bit more newer, Western, uh, Germany, uh, Belgium, and things like that. So. Yeah, yeah. And, and and then you get a variety of pictures. And the good thing about it, then we come back and then we have a show. Uh, that's what we did. We would, right when you, it, it was called the Little Gallery. It's not there anymore. But right when you walk into the photo building, Building 7 from, I don't know, I guess if you're coming from the Union, you turn right and you go into the photo building, you have that stairwell. It just walks all the way up top of the second floor where the big window was, where the printing press used to be. Yeah. You walk up there, and there was a gallery there. It was it was a beautiful, small little gallery. It was called the Little Gallery, white wall. You well, you can paint them any way you did. It. And students, primarily uh, seniors, would have like their senior show oh, nice. up over there. So I remember my friend Bob. You know, as soon as we came back, uh, because we were work, we we took a class. 
and we were able to go in the dark room. So he finished up a lot of his prints and he had a show there. Then my friend Mike and I, we combined ourselves together and we put all our photographs from, from Salzburg mm -hmm. in, in Europe and everything. We made a, a, a even bigger show up there. And uh, so that, and you sign up and, and, and you have a show. So that was a beautiful space for a, beautiful lighting and you could have a little um, party mm -hmm. for your for your exhibit and uh, yeah it was a lot of fun and, and and that's what a lot of kids would do when they came back from Salzburg I remember um, well I would imagine that Paula Bronstein that I told you to look right. up I don't know if they had that Salzburg College thing I believe they did because I seen her pictures and they were all about Europe now she didn't have a show there, but she had it in the union. In the union, in the in the cases. I don't know if they're still over there. There were cases with with uh, glass, yeah. and she had all her photographs up over there. She may have a show up there, uh, up in the photo gallery also. But I, as a freshman, I distinctly remember looking at those and saying, "Wow, she." You know, after I learned about what photography is, after seeing mm -hmm. the picture of the bicyclist and everything, yeah. and then I would go back to, oh, okay, I see what she's doing, and she was really good, yeah. and I loved her photographs. So apparently, it, you know, people, when they come back, they would want to, if they had a good body of work, they would want to show it, and hers were, 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 were very good, so mm -hmm. I was glad to see that. That's nice. And did you guys do, um, did you have any type of senior show then? That was our senior show. Oh, that show. was your senior yeah. show. That's fair. Um, and there, you know, obviously you have the MFA gallery, but we couldn't use that. And mm -hmm. that space right there was uh, for your senior show if you wanted to, and you would have to sign up for it. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob, he was able to get his right, shoot, his was the first show, so right in September. And Mike and I, when we combined, we everyone had signed up for it. And Well, actually... We both signed up, uh, and this is what I was mad, but we both, we both signed up for a show, mm -hmm. and Mike had his a little bit later than mine, and it was in the springtime. And so my first-year instructor, Michael Saluri, whom I really liked, and I like Mike and everything, and um, he had another freshman class, and I don't know what it was. It was like a freshman something mm -hmm. that was coming on over there. And all you the students are going to have all their parents come around. And, you know, that's so geeky. I don't know. It's so stupid. Yeah, because, you know, my mother was Greek. You know, <laughs> like she was going to come to something like that. No way. <laughs> so, so he begged me, you know, oh, please, please let me have, because it was at that spot. Please let me have that spot. And I said, but there's no other spot. I want to have a show. Oh, please, just go, go with Mike. Combine with Mike. Mike, you can, Mike can have a show. I said, well, you know, I kind of want a, you know, just to have my own show. And he just kept begging because he wanted to show the students, parents, how well his freshman class was progressing. So, all right, Mike, I'll go with Mike. <laughs> so, so Lori had that space. So I combined with Mike. I was a little bit mad, but then I said, oh, what? forget your ego. Mike is a good friend of mine. He had a lot of good work. I had good work, and we put a show together. It was a bigger show, and it went really well. And then, you know, we brought Greek food. He's Italian. He brought Italian food, and it was a big, you know, opening and everything like that. So we had a great time. So in retrospect, yeah. You know, I would have liked to have my own show, but why? It was actually better with Mike. Yeah. And he was a good friend of mine. And the party was a lot better because it was a big combined Greco-Roman yeah. feast. That's really nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, is the Bob you keep mentioning, is that Bob, Bob Manganelli? Bob Mulker, oh, oh, Mulker. Manganelli, Mulker, his name was Mulkern. Right. Then he changed, he changed it to, it to me. Me. I made fun of him with that. <laughs> he kept telling him, All right, Bob Mulkern. Now, that's a crappy name for an artist. You know, like Jackson Pollock, that's a great name. <laughs> Henry Cartier Brisson, that's a great name. Yeah. And then I would say Christopher Nakis. Now that's a good name. Now Bob Mulkern. <laughs> <laughs> so we were walking down the quarter mile and he was saying, yo, but actually my last name, my real last name is Manganelli. So I'll change my name. I'll change it to Mulkern Manganelli, and my friends can call me Kern. And I said, now, Manganelli sounds good because it's a good Italian. It, it kind of, you know, rolls. Manganelli. 
So then finally, when he went to um, um, UCLA Film School mm -hmm. back in, <laughs> and he changed his name to uh, Robert Manganelli then. So it's been Manganelli That's since awesome. then. <laughs> so that was funny when he did it, but it was, uh, you know, we were thinking about, okay, how uh, we have to have a name, and, you know, we have to have a good name because artists, you know, have a good name. And if yeah. you don't have a good name, you get a nickname like Ouija or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's funny. Um, okay. And then I guess next, when did you, what year did you graduate from RIT? 1983, the fall of 83. So I started okay. fall of 79, I'm uh, not the fall, the spring of 83. Fall of 79 to the spring of 83, just boom, straight through Perfect. with no, uh, with no, uh, uh, you know, cuts in between or yeah. anything like that. And did you have any plans of what you were going to do after college? That oh yeah, it was. Uh, well, uh, it, 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 it was chasing that rectangle. I'm always chasing that rectangle to to try to master it. Mm -hmm. And so, I wasn't going to go into sports photography or wedding photography or go to the studios in New York City because a lot of guys, like as I was saying. In the professional photography and the studio realm, if you wanted to learn that, RIT was great at that also because they had all the equipment and they had the instructors for that. And a lot of photographers, when they graduated from RIT, they made great assistants in New York City. And all the photographers in New York said, okay, all right, he's a RIT graduate. Yeah, boom, because he knows how to move, use the lights, do this. And then they were great assistants. So I didn't want to do that though. And so my dream once I graduated in 83 I used the dark rooms to get a portfolio set but I knew I needed more than just hey this is my college portfolio here and you know hey can I knock on doors you couldn't do that so you had to take a next step you had to do something different and although mine wasn't that different but I said all right what where can I try to get the best photographs so at least I can make some type of impact, some type of something from my next step. And uh, since I, uh, I did pretty well with photographing my family in the freshman year, and then when we were obviously in Austria, uh, just everything from like Egypt and Greece and all that, uh, I said, okay, I have a home in Greece my father's house it's just still in the village over there I can stay there for a year and uh, just stay there and shoot as much as you can document it as much as you can and come back with hopefully good photographs print them up and take them try to exhibit them try New York City try Chicago even Rochester try anywhere just try to make a name for yourself I already had that good name, Christopher Nake, said I thought it was a good name. <laughs> and then, now you have their photographs to back that up. Mm -hmm. Where Manganelli, Mulker, no, he had to change his name <laughs> to try to do it. So, so I had that, and I said, all right, let's see if I can, uh, if I can pursue that. But unfortunately, my mother, at that point, she got sick. So what I was doing is I got my first job at... Mel Simons Photo Labs, which is on Field Street. I don't know if you know where Field Street is over here. It's right off of Monroe Avenue. Okay. It's a bakery. It's an old bakery, but he set it up as a photo lab. Right. And so I was, take, I was kind of taking the summer of 83 off. You know, we were just joking around, going to parties, trying to see, you know, how many girlfriends we can get or something before we had, you know, had to get serious. And my mother, oh, yeah, you got to get to work. What are you doing? You lazy. Blah, blah, blah. She came, yeah, yeah. I said, all right, all right. So finally, you know, towards the end of the summer, I went up. I walked up to the store and I grabbed a newspaper and I looked at the wanted page. I mean, you guys don't have that anymore, but I looked at the wanted page and it said, photographic black and white technician needed. I said, oh, all right, Mel Simon. So I called him up I said, and I made an appointment for the next day. He said, yeah, sure. So I took my portfolio. I went over there and he looked at it. And I guess he kind of liked it. He said, okay, you got a job. Can you start tomorrow? I went, sure. So I went and he was so backlogged. And I'm, this was, I mean, 
it was black and white photography, yeah, I mean, printing, and you know you had photography for, for for periodicals from the Jewish Community Center, for like the YMCA's, you know, these staff photographers doing these things with ladies doing aerobics and everything. So you know you had to photo, you know, print all these things up, and so he had so much work. And, and, and mind you, this is fall going into the winter and everything. So I'd get there at 8 o'clock, and I wouldn't get out till like, 12. Mm. So you're in the dark room, and you get out maybe half hour for lunch, and you get a little bit of light. And you got back in the dark room all those hours, and you become a zombie yeah. for all that. But he had so much work, we had to work on Saturday also. And my mother kept going, oh, no, you're working too hard. No, 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 no. She's the opposite. You're working too hard now. You're, you're going to kill yourself. So, but he's got a lot of work. He's got to get that done. And so um, she got sick. And I worked at my uncle's restaurant just to, uh, well, I was trying to make as much money so I can leave the following year and live for a whole year in Greece. And so that I was just working as hard much as I as much as I could and just keeping my bank account without touching it so I had something but then she got sick and so I had to take care of her and so that trip didn't go and my father came back from Texas so I knew he knew, knew about and then cuz you know, she died and everyone was in disarray my brother was still in high school my sister was floating in the ozone somewhere my uh, my father is over here, you know, you come there, okay, what do you want? All right, let's open up a repair garage. So we open up a repair garage and we start working, and it's so hard, it's so much work, you wouldn't believe, I mean, because it's a AAA station, we're towing, gas station, it's a big garage, everyone's breaking down, we, oh man, it's a, and then I went, oh. after two months opening it, I've got to go back. I, I, I have all this money saved up. If I don't do it now, I'll never do this. So I just went back. I didn't say the whole year, but almost a whole year, and I just shot, boom, 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 got all the my 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 film. Mm -hmm. Then came back, worked, worked, worked. Then I took a couple. I took a, a class at RIT. I used uh, Kathy Collins. You know, Mike Solori actually. He was still teaching there, so they gave me a a um, uh, you know night school mm -hmm. uh, for like two credit hours, three credit hours, so I paid for that, and that enabled me to go out in there, you know, process all my film and everything, and then I got another, the next quarter I was able to go in the dark room, it was the same thing, and then print up all the pictures that I had. And then I built a dark room in my basement, and then I was able to print the, re and, but I, I mean, there were so many photographs that I didn't, I couldn't print them all on silver, prints and everything mm -hmm. and so that's why I made my blog and then I just dodged and burned photoshopped them and put them on the blog so all those pictures are up there and I'm not doing the photoshop correctly but because I'm using like dodging and burning tools instead mm -hmm. of sectioning things up I don't know how to do that so I was just using like I'm like I'm dodging and burning I don't know Right. And a larger, so mm -hmm. I'm using, there's a dodging tool, tick -a -tick -a -tick -a -tick -a, and then there's the burning tool, ping -a -ping -a -ping, and you're lightening these up, darkening these up. It's not the right way to do it, but that's, that's life. Yeah. <laughs> and so then I just put those up on the, on the blog, and that's that. Cool. Very cool. I'm going to ask, I don't know if it's like, but do you care if I switch it to like the other side? Mm -hmm. Just, I don't want it to, oh, it, I don't know if it's rubbing or it rubbing? what. It's probably fine. Okay. It's probably okay. Um, okay. Yeah, let's both get some water and then mm -hmm. we can. But I'm giving you a lot of stuff so you can edit shit. Yeah, it's perfect. All right? it's so perfect. that's why I'm just going no, as you're much and much as possible. And then I got stories of Austin. I got a bunch of stuff that I can tell you. I know, but I know. Just give me no, the you're... most important stuff that you want and I'll try to expand on those so you so you can narrow everything down so mm -hmm. you have enough you know just like shooting film if you're going to shoot something when you're a photojournalist if you're going to uh, let's say there's something happening at merchants over there you know a big water main break and it's snowing ah and you're going to shoot it well you got to go there oh well you don't have film but let's say hey you get 10 rolls of film and you have to shoot chum 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 because you have to tell your story mm -hmm. so you need the footage so exactly. you need the footage and uh so obviously not everything is going to be good, but you never know what you have. And then you make 
blow it up and pick it, and you, now you've got the picture. So okay. I'm giving you all that bullshit over here. Well, so. that's a great way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> so you can edit it out. Yeah. Um, so I did want to talk about your mom a little bit. Is okay. That, is that okay? No, that's fine. Okay, awesome. Um, so I guess just starting off, just tell me a little bit about your mom growing okay. up. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. My mom, she grew up during... Um, well, my mom and my father, because they're from the same village, and they're about the same age also. Mm -hmm. So she grew up in, um, it's called Flamburo, Florina. It's a village from Florina. It's the last village on this one road. It's in the mountains, a very nice village. And um, they grew up during World War II. And then right after World War II, they had a civil war, which no one really knows about that, you know, they know Vietnam, South Korea and everything, you know, but the same thing happened right after uh, World War II. You had um, uh, the nationalists and the communists fighting each other. And where we are up north in uh, Macedonia and in, in Greece, it's, it's very mountainous and it looks like the Adirondacks. I don't know if you've ever gone yeah. to the Adirondacks. Mm -hmm. it's, a lot of vegetation, uh, woods, everything, very mountainous and everything. Right. So over there, the communists were pushed all the way up there, and they can use those things for guerrilla fighting because it lent itself, the topography landed itself over there. So they grew up, you know, starving <laughs> in World War II with the Germans and then starving from, from the Civil War. So they knew how to make things, you know, stretch mm -hmm. for like, you know, eating and everything like that. And uh, so she grew up in that period. And then um, my grandfather finally was able to make it. Uh, her father was finally able to make it to the United States. His first try failed. He was in France and then he tried again and he finally made it there. And... I guess he's just started working at a restaurant as usual, and then my older my uncle and my mother came with him afterwards, and then she came back to Greece and she married my father, and this was in the fifties, and then they came over here, so they uh, well they started a family, and my father was very industrious, so and he had a good. Uh, trade and mechanics. It was a very good mechanic. So, just working one week and uh, one year in a bus stop, then he was able to open up his uh, garages and everything. So my mother well, was taking care of the family, and so after a while, you know, they bought a house, the parquet, and well, they separated. So my mother was the only one you know, taking care of us over in the, in the city as we were growing up on Vic Parquet. And um, when we moved to Henrietta in 72, uh, she had the house on Vic Parquet where she would rent it out and she would do all the upkeeping of it and everything. Obviously, when she needed some heavier work, I would help her out. But she was taking care of that because we were still in school. I was sixth grade, seventh grade. And and my sister, well, like I said, she was always in the ozone flying around. So, so she would work on that. And then she got a job at my uncle's restaurant on East Main Street. And she was a waitress. So throughout all of junior high school, high school, college, she would get up. She couldn't drive. She would pick up the bus from uh, <laughs> Suburban Plaza. And she would go all the way to the city. And she'd work all day all night and she would come back boom, with the bus and then she'd go shopping either at Star Market, Wegmans or Tops, mm -hmm. whoever had the most sales and she would just condense everything and she would save and skim and things. Yeah, there's, okay. <laughs> I'll give you some ideas of how she saved money, all right, how she would skim. So for instance, we would shower. Mm -hmm. She wouldn't shower because oh, that's a waste of water. It keeps going down. So she would put like about three inches of water in the bathtub and she would, you know, get in there and she would wash herself. And, you know, and you can hear the skin on the porcelain and it makes a weird noise. So, but we're used to it because we heard it. So freshman year, 
Bob slept over one night, and it was my brother and I. We had two twin beds, and Bob was on the sleeping bag over there. So we were over there, we were talking about it, whatever. Where my mother went to take a, a bath, <laughs> and so sure enough, you know, the noise of we grub and pop. He jumps, he's looking around. <laughs> What's going on over here? What if he thought something was on the roof, like raccoons or something coming? What's going on over there? He said, what? And he said, can't you hear that? No, because it's white noise to it. Oh, that thing right there. Oh, that's mom. She's in the bathtub washing. So I had to explain to her why she does that, because mm-hmm. she, she would save everything. And she would just, didn't matter, everything was on sale. She would never buy anything that wasn't on sale. And she would scrimp and she would do everything. And then... You know, that's how she kept uh, the house at Vic Park A and our house at, because uh, she was taking care of the mortgage mm-hmm. over there. My father, when he was around, yeah, he would, he would help, but, you know, he was always, fl- you know, floating in the other ozone, mm-hmm. you know, going all over the place. So, and then she skimmed and, you know, she helped me through college. And, you know, anytime I would work, like when I came back from Austria, I found a job splitting wood all summer and it was in chai lai churchville chai lai so from rush henrietta to churchville chai lai you don't know it because you're not from around but it take and i would ride i didn't have a car at that point because uh, my other one broke down mm-hmm. when i came back from Australia, i couldn't fix it so i would ride my bike an hour and a half wow all the way okay going the back way to rit to jefferson road all the way to the end of jefferson road mm-hmm. Chai Lai Avenue, all the way Buffalo Road, anyways, and we chop wood, boom, boom. And back then it was five dollars an hour, which is nothing now. But then it was pretty good under the table. So chop wood, split wood all day. It was beautiful because it was in the sun and everything. And then ride all the way back home, an hour and a half. I never got a flat tire, which was beautiful. And then, and the guy would pay you at the end of the day, you know, forty-five dollars, nine hours of work, boom, and, you, and he'd give you beer. For a, for a break with the sandwich. You know, you, you bring your sandwich, but he'd give you a brewski. The other guy, though, would he'd give you some water. But one guy, Clyde, he'd give you a brewski. So we would sit and eat. And then I would just, when I went home, because I knew how much my mother would work, and she would skimp and everything, and she was helping me out with college. So all that money that I, I would just give it to her. And you know, I'll take it. Oh, no, I don't need it. I don't need it because I can get anything anywhere. And so... Uh, and so I was trying to always help her out like that because with a little bit of nothing, she would make so much. And obviously when she died, you know, she, she left. So she, she had two houses. The one she gave to my sister. The other house was in my name. She had a big bank account that she gave to my brother. And with that stuff together, my, I put another mortgage on the house and my, my brother's uh, money that he got from my mother. We were able to open up that big business in the Acus Auto Care, which was very lucrative for 20 years. So it was, it, w- it was a big automotive place. And so that came from my mother, actually. Awesome. And, uh, yeah, she, she was tough. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, you know, and then she, in 84, yeah, 84, 84, my uncle, they sold, the city bought the restaurant, Okay. Over there, so he was building another restaurant, and so she had to start working again. To um, it's called Hickey Freeman. It's a clothing store. They make suits and everything over here. Now mm-hmm. that was the first job she got when she came to the United States. Oh, cool. So now she was there, and she kept feeling something. She'd come home, and say, "Oh, they had the fans on over there. My head hurts and everything like that." Stupid fans. So she put a, her shawl on and everything. And so you're always complaining about, "Oh, that dumb fan. It's hurting my head." We didn't know what was happening, and then finally we realized what was happening. So then, yeah. in the eighty, so then, when she got sick, and she had her operation, we had to take care of her. And then at that point, I said, "Well, you know, I'm always here with her, so I'll just document this. And since I couldn't go to Greece, I'll just stay here and I'll document my mother. So I just had uh, a whole uh, series of work." from when she was, you know, struggling that whole time until she finally died, until we had to put her into the hospital again because she went into a coma. It was a brain tumor. So at the end, she went into a coma, which is, uh, I mean, it's better because there's, there's no pain. Mm-hmm. 
but she doesn't know she's out and right. by the time we had her in there i think it was in august so by september 15th 85 is when she she finally died and uh and that's uh that's olga <laughs> and you know my friend bob uh, he knows olga mike olga george my, uh, that i still uh hang out with from from college oh they all know her and so yeah she was something yeah she sounds like it. Mm -hmm. She does. Um, so, obviously, I'm sure it was a, a big task to even just take care of her, but uh, what, was, what were some of the challenges of also documenting her sickness? Um, you know, that's a good question, and it's, uh, I don't know, you may not think it's a good response, but it was actually pretty easy. Yeah because she's seen me photographing all the time. So for her, it was, oh, here he goes again. So it was, it was like, the, you know, the, her washing herself in, a, in, in, in the tub. For us, it became white noise. Yeah. Well, the camera around all the time, that was white that noise was for white her. Noise so it too. didn't matter to her. Like, yeah. So I can, I can photo, no matter what, she didn't care how I photographed her, mm -hmm. where I did, whether it was, candid shots or if I set her up somewhere here let me photograph you here and everything it didn't matter mm -hmm. and um, she kind of liked it because then it was she and I were together the whole right. time so there was always that camaraderie mm -hmm. and uh, and it was um, and, yeah, and for me it was I mean it, it's something where I mean you have this old world woman that uh, you know has all these old clothes and she has these weird things that she does. For instance, she knew she was sick, so she has, <laughs> her, her instinct is put a lot of clothes on to keep everything warm. So she would, I mean, it'd be 90 degrees outside and she'd have all her clothes and a jacket on and a shawl. And she'd think, all right, mom. <laughs> and so those type of things were kind of uh, nice photographically. Right. And so I would shoot her and, you know, as far as, Photography, just plain photography. It's uh, it's something that's photogenic. So, you know, in bow hunting, say you want to shoot a big deer, well, you want to go into the woods where there are big deer. Mm -hmm. You don't go to the woods where they don't have any big deer because you're not going to get a big deer there. Right. So, <laughs> and the same thing in photography. If you want to shoot something interesting, go to some place that's interesting. You don't go something that's blasé. Because you're not going to get an interesting photograph. Exactly. So it's a lot of, I mean, it sounds a little cold. Okay, it may be. But I'm there. I'm her son. I'm taking care of her. We have that rapport with one another. She knows I'm photographing. I know it looks good. So I'm just going to shoot her. Mm -hmm. And that's, and I would always have those photographs. And that's what I have. Yeah. Did she get to see some nothing. along the way? She didn't see anything. No, nothing because I didn't. Um, I just, I just shot all the film, and I you know, when she died in she died in September of '85, mm -hmm. and that was right at the beginning of the school year, RIT school year. So I went to RIT. It was a little bit late, but I got a hold of I think Mike Salu. Yeah. Boom, yes, it was Mike Salori. Mike Salori was still over there, and, I, and then I asked him, I said, could I take a night course with you, you know, two credit hours, uh, yeah. you know, independent study. Yeah, no problem, boom. Nice. So that's when I took the independent study, and I did her stuff over there. And then when I went, came back from Greece in 86, 87, I did the same thing. Right. Salori was gone, but Kathy Collins was there. So she let me do that. So I did uh, that work with Kathy Collins, and then I couldn't finish. She left, and then Dwayne he used to run the uh, the cage, mm -hmm. but he had graduated from photography, and then he was teaching a class, and okay. I knew him pretty well. So he let me take a you know a couple credits, yeah. independent study, and uh, and then as long as I showed them the prints at the end, stuff, they yeah. didn't have to. They knew I was going to work. I wasn't just going to blow everything. I wanted to get into the dark room. That's why I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. So, and they didn't have. Well, let me see your photograph. You can do this over here. And they just let me go. And then at the end, I showed them my work, and they went, "Oh, that'll be good." Yeah. And that was it. 
Yeah. Well, I'm sure she'd be very proud. I love those images <laughs> of her. They're really nice. Um, how do you how do you feel now that you have those images to look back on? Like, I'm sure that's a really good. Oh yeah, thing. yeah. Obviously, um, I, I I like them. Um, it's uh, you know I had a couple exhibits and everything where I would put some things up, uh, but I was and, and then I would put them online on my blog and everything. But it's uh, you know I'm I'm glad that I. I'm glad that I took the time to uh, to photograph her in 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 that way because I uh, you know because I had her with me the whole time and I was able to to shoot it to experience it so I have the documentation of it now my father actually the same thing um, he just died this year right uh, he was 91. And the same thing, uh, brain tumor. Wow. But, um, and obviously this goes with my uh, dog town and my dumbass brother-in-law and, and the way that stuff. So I didn't have the opportunity to take care of him. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to take care of him at his place. And I would have been his nurse and everything. And by doing so, I would have photographed him mm -hmm. during that time. And... Um, but because of all the stupid things, and my sister put him in a, you know, like a nursing home and everything, which was uh, irritating. So and then, so I don't have that with him, which I would have done that. I would have mm -hmm. taken care of him, and I would have, I would have, I would have photographed. Now I did in 2012 when he was 80. He was in Greece, mm -hmm. and um, he um, he was doing his bees. He's a beekeeper. Oh, right. And plus, he got some sweet corn from the U.S. and he really good corn, and he grew it there. And then he, this was the year before, and then he sold it. He made it like five hundred euros there. Hey, that's pretty good. So now he wanted to do the same thing. And in, coming from the mountains, there's a, a stream, a river they call, it, but it's like a stream, mm -hmm. and it's dammed up. And so he was he wanted to see, oh, how can I irrigate this thing by using the so he goes up to the dam and he is trying to um, to see how he can irrigate his thing. So long story short, he jumps off the dam, and on the dam, you know, it's slimy, greeny, algae, mm. water and stuff, and it's on the cement. And so he doesn't fall into the water, which is right next to him, four feet of water. He falls on the other side, which is twenty feet down into cement. Of course. And he's boom, and now he's laid up. And someone has to take care of them. So we're just trying to figure out um, a nurse over there to help them, but they have to come from the city into the village, and, and it's going to cost more. So when you did all the math, it was easier to have somebody here go over there and take care of them than to have somebody from there to do it, and plus they're not going to give them the right care. My sister didn't want to do it, so I did it. So I nursed him back, and I photographed him there a little bit while I was there. Oh, nice. And so I have that, which is like a, um, you know, it's 10 years prior to when he, he did die. So I have that that I can use, but it's not the same yeah. as when, if, if I had him over here taking care of him while he was dying. Mm -hmm. so. Right. Right. Okay. All right. Um, and now, I guess go just to, to go back just a little bit mm -hmm. back to when you lived in Greece. Um, so you lived in Greece in the year of eighty six. Eighty six. Is that right? Yep. Okay. Um, tell me a little bit more about that year. I know you talked a little bit, but you, so you stayed in your father's home. Mm -hmm. Did you have any other family around? Yeah, my uh, yeah. Well, family I have like cousins, second cousins, everything. I'm related to a bunch of, a bunch of people over there. Right. And so they're all over the place. Uh, really close family, my, my brother, my father's brother, my uncle, he was there in another village, uh, my cousin and, uh, you know, closer family like that. But most of my close family came to the United States. Right. So I just have them, and then I just have second and third cousins floating all over the, the landscape there. Okay. And so um, when I was there, I brought a bicycle. Uh, 
And it was easy too, because it was, you know, 86. You didn't have 9-11. So I went there, I had a backpack, an army pack, and a big rectangular box where you had to put the bike. I bought it from Bike Nash Bar. So, and I had that with me. And on a, uh, actually Mike Groen, who we went to Austria with, he gave me, because I stayed with him, I flew out of New York City, mm -hmm. so I stayed with him overnight, and he gave me, uh, when you, did you ever shoot with a view camera? No, probably not. Well, yeah, okay, so a view camera comes in a big, like, suitcase, and you put it on its side, and you have a little cart with straps, and um, you go cool. around like that. With the view. So he had that. So he goes, you know, Snake, you know, you're going to need this thing with that bicycle thing. So he gave me that thing, which was beautiful. That's so I come nice. out of the airport, and you got to go through customs, <laughs> and I have this big bike, big backpack, and everything. And I don't look Greek, so... You have the Greek cops over there, I, 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 trying to shuffle everybody. It was the old airport trying to shuffle everybody over there. And he's looking at me and said, what, what, what's this? And I said, Podilato. And then you look at oh, you're Greek? Yeah, you start so talking, like, yeah, speaking oh, Greek. Yeah. And he goes, can I just come this way? And he shuffles me. I don't have to stay in line or anything. And he just shuffles me off into the, into the, and I just got a taxi and found my cousin. So, <laughs> so with that bike, I rode to all the little villages around Flamburo, and I would stop. I would uh, I would go to the to the to a uh, cafe Neo. A cafe Neo is uh, is like a coffee shop, mm -hmm. and uh, it's for mostly uh, elderly males. Males would go there. You know, old guys. They sit there and they talk and they play cards. They drink coffee. They have their worry beads. Boom, boom, boom. So, and I would I, I have a. My summer uniform. My summer uniform is uh, just a pair of shorts and uh, and uh, wrestling shoes. <laughs> so I would so I would go to because it's summer. It's yeah. nice. I don't know what you're crazy. So I would go to village to village, and I would go to the Cafe Neo because at the Cafe Neo you're always going to find a couple of Greeks over there. <laughs> so I'd go over there, and they'd look at me. And, and I can hear him talking. They go, "What's this German over here? What's he? He's, uh, <laughs> he lost his way over here. This tourist German all the time." So I would talk to Greek to him. Oh, and I see. And he said, "Well, you're Greek." And then, would, and then I would tell him, "Yeah, could you watch it? Because I'm going to go photograph you. Could you watch my bike over here while I photograph a villain?" <laughs> yeah, go ahead. And then you know they're all looking. At everything. So then I would walk through the village, and I would just photograph. Boom, boom who's ever there? And you, you know, I'd get like a strange look from everybody because you know I, I got a pair of wrestling shoes on a pair of shorts on and a camera and that's it <laughs> you know and my bag where my film is and i'm just going around shooting and i would stop and talk to people and they would get a kick out of it and i would tell them what's going on and so boom 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 so each village and there are lots of places that i would stop and then i would go back and then they would know me at that point. Ah, I'm a photographer. You put your bike here <laughs> and go around and mm -hmm. I'd photograph again. And, uh, you know, you talk and you help people out. In, in the village, in our village, mm -hmm. everyone, they hated chopping wood. They Wood stoves and they would come from, and there's a big pile in front of everybody's house. They have to chop it and then they have to stack it. I hate stacking it, but chopping is a lot of fun. Because, you know, I did that when I came back yeah. from Austria also. So I would go to house to house in there. Because they have their siestas from 12 to 2. And it's because it's hot there. And, you know, in the summer. And I said, are you crazy? I mean, this is a beautiful summer over here. I'm living in Rochester. It's 95% gray and <laughs> overcast. So I'm over there. So I, I would chop wood from everybody. Boom, boom, boom. I would chop it all. And they would love it. So they would feed me. Awesome. Boom. And I go to the next person. They, they were always waiting. Oh, okay. When am I going to come over there and chop the wood? I chop the wood and they would feed me. And so that's how I made a lot. That's awesome. We eat a lot. Yeah. Because <laughs> I was going to ask you, but you were talking about before how you saved a lot. But then I was going to yeah. ask you how. You, say, you saved a lot. And, you know, the dollar went a long ways back then. Uh, it wasn't a euro at that point. The, uh, the EU didn't come. It wasn't in existence. So it was a. Uh, drachma was the the money. Oh, and when you go to a, you know, you go to a, uh, when you're in the islands, and it was so cheap, and you know you're swimming, doing everything, and you get hung in by twelve or one, you get your, you can rent a little um, a Vespa or a little mobile. It was, it was so cheap. Mm -hmm. You go up to a cafe, 
or the Psistaria, a taverna, a tavern, and you get this meal. Oh, you get a choriatiki salata, which is a Greek salad with, with moussaka or pastizio or any Greek dish or anything, and with a big thing of beer. Amstel beer, oh, it was so good. It, oh, it would just go so good with a side of like lemon potatoes and everything. It would cost five dollars or even less for that whole thing. <laughs> oh, man, you would kill it. So, That's awesome. so it went a long way. So when I came back, I still had money left over also. Oh, but that's awesome. by the time you chop. And when we were going there, because my friend Andy that we went to, he never wanted to stay in a hotel. So we, like for instance, we went, we went to Crete. We, we slept on the beach. Mm. We had our backpacks and um, we would find a place. And you had those roll, you know, those roll things. Uh, yeah, yeah, they were rolling things. You roll that out, and you put like a piece of uh, uh, styrofoam, mm -hmm. and that, and then you have your back or your your sleeping bag on there, and you would sleep right on the beach. And we'd leave the bags there, and uh, you know, you wake up when you have a, the sea is like glassy Aegean Sea. You have the sun rising in the east. It's so beautiful, blue, blue everything. It's wow. so nice, and then. You know, you're there the whole day, and you're swimming, photographing, doing things. Then you get up, and you hitchhike, you go to the next beach, and you just sleep over there. And when you go into town, you know, I would take my camera and my money and everything, but you just leave everything on the beach. No one bothered, no one did anything. You go into town, you know, you do those things that young kids do, running around, dancing, doing things, eating, and then you come home, come back, and you just roll it up, and you sleep under the, because it never rains there, and you sleep in the stars. And that's where we go. You know, we went there, Santorini, Eos, everywhere. That's amazing. And, uh, so it was nice. Yeah, <laughs> that's really nice. Um, I was going to ask where, what inspired your photography while you are there, but it seems like you had a lot of different, like, new scenery a lot of the times. So. Yeah, it was, yeah. Um, and, and like I said, um, you're a photojournalist, mm -hmm. so you want to tell a story. Right. The way... I mean, I mean, it's probably cliche, or yeah, it is. It's nothing new. I'm not inventing anything. But for me, like I said, mastering that rectangle, for me, every shot has to be the story. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a significant bunch of pictures to say something. Each shot has to be its own. It can be part of a story, but each shot has to be something that I would want not, not everything is going to be your masterpiece, but something that is going to work, and it cannot be cropped. It has to have a black border around it so you know that it's a full-frame photograph. And so there's no Photoshop to take things away and, mm -hmm. and add something out there. The only thing you do is you manipulate the tones. I mean, obviously, you know, I don't know if you, if you ever... If you've been working in the dark room, you shoot something, oh, here's a, you got a nice negative, which is good, you got the tones, and then you make a work print out of it. Well, <laughs> you got to dodge and burn because you don't have good tonal ranges, and it's just, you, you have to learn the technique of how to print, right. how long to keep it in the developer and everything. And then after that, uh, if you need to use ferrocyanide to whiten something up, after that, what we would do, we would use selenium tone when it's all done. And a selenium toner, you can use it so it can be either a brownish hue or a cold bluish hue. I like the, the, the colder bluish hue. And what you do, you put that in there. It's how stupid I am, too. You put it, selenium oil is very toxic. Mm. And it has a very strong scent. And you want to wear gloves and everything. But me, I'm stupid. I never wear gloves. And I would smell it because, okay, is that the right dilution? Because you have, if you dilute it too much, it's, it's brown. But if you just put a little, you know, one to nine or something, then it's a, it's a bluer, colder tone. And you smell it, and you're not supposed to do it, so I'm probably going to die of cancer. <laughs> so, so then you, you use a selenium, and the selenium is a lot more stable than silver, so it replaces all of the silver with okay. selenium, and that's why you have that tone. And that's how you do the archive of things and all that, and all that other bullshit. And that's what all my... And that's what the what, what the pictures are. And so each picture has to be that. So I don't care if it's everything's from Greece or mm -hmm. everything's from Egypt or you have pictures from Italy, South America, Russia and Riata, Pittsburgh. This, it, it doesn't matter as long as it, it fits within, everything fits within the frame. Right. And, that's, uh, and that is 
the quest, you'll never get the perfect picture, and that's what you're striving for mm -hmm. the whole time. Okay. So awesome. it's easy when you're in Greece photographing and everything. I mean, first of all, you have a Greek light. Oh man, you, you, the Greek sky is that turquoise blue mm. forever, especially in the summer because it yeah. hardly rains. And you have the sun rises, the sunset, and the way it hits objects. Painters go there because they love the light and they love painting things there. And, you know, it's, as I said, if you want to shoot a big deer, you know, you're going to go to uh, Kansas. You're not going to go to uh, Delaware. <laughs> so if you want to take a good photograph, you got to go to, you know, you'll go to uh, Turkey. You're not going to go to Churchill Chile. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, well, as much as I want to stay in Greece in my mind right now, I'm going to bring us back to Rochester, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But um, so when you got back to Rochester after this trip to Greece, was it just developing all these images and then kind of trying to make more of a name for yourself? Is that where you were at that point? Yeah, we, we came back and we had, we had amassed a uh, portfolio mm -hmm. from from that whole experience of studying in Europe. And plus we had the class that we had to take in that summer was Solori's photojournalism class, actually. So we had to do photojournalism. And so we had our freshman year. So, and this is what we were thinking about. Okay, we had our freshman year. We had our photographs from our freshman year. We had our photographs from our sophomore year. We had our photographs from our uh, junior year over there. And now what are we gonna do for our senior year? Well, we have to come up with, uh, for, instance, for what my purposes was, I needed to have a strong body of work, a portfolio to show, okay, this is my college stuff. So now I have to move forward in uh, my senior year, which was a mistake that I made because I should have gone by the time we came back, um, they changed the curriculum okay. around. So when we were in, uh, when we were studying our senior year, well, first we did take that class, photojournalism, and we had different uh, projects that we had to do around here. Like we had to do a county fair. We photographed that as a, as a, as a all the students, and uh, it was, you know. Uh, upper class students. It wasn't freshmen like we went to yeah. Byron Bergen before it was fresh. And Mike Salori was the photographer. So he took he took us to um, to New York City. He always wanted to take a class in New York. He always said that when we were fresh. Oh I can't wait, I gotta take a class in New York City and have him photograph that. Oh I can't wait. <laughs> so he finally did. When we were juniors he took that summer course class and there were about fifteen of us and we went to New York City. And we stayed at the Jewish Y, and everybody had a project. I think I told you about this the last time. Everybody had projects to do. My project was, all right, all these Greeks are own these vending machines. Right. You know, they're selling pretzels and hot dogs outside over there. So I said, oh, I got to do this. So I photographed <laughs> them, and you know, then they're, hey, what, what are you doing, man? Like, you know, the, the Greek accent. So I would talk to them in Greek. Oh, you're Greek, boom! So you give me hot dogs and everything. Then I went to Astoria. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because there are other Greeks, so I went over there, and, and, this, and this guy befriended me, took me in, and his wife was cooking me all these omelets and this. And Bob, he was back at, at our room, and we had peanut butter and jelly that we both bought so we could have the whole time there. Yeah. We, we didn't have any money, and he was complaining. Oh, you always freaking fun. And he was playing. You was do so seem to always find the good yeah, bits. Yeah, oh, motherfucker. You make a snake. You're always getting this stuff. I can't believe it. I'm here eating peanut butter. And I'm laughing. I'm saying, oh, yeah, that's why I had to date Bob. <laughs> that's funny. Um, and, and, oh, well, well, let me finish up so I yeah, can yeah. edit this up. So, so in that, they had, they switched it off. There's a photo illustration, photojournalism, and fine art. So I first started with the photojournalism. There was this guy, it was his first year of photojournalism, and he, I really didn't like him. He was like this, like a beat photographer. Yeah, yeah that's what you gotta do, beat, beat, beat. I said, well, that's not my like photography, I can't do it. 
So I was going to go right into fine art because I just wanted to master their rectangle as usual. But then I talked to my friend Bob and Mike, and they were saying, well, you know, this is RIT. Take advantage of the technical aspect of using the flash and the studio and every, we already we know how to do this stuff and everything. And I was, ah, and they talked me into it, so I was in their class with them. And, and it was the worst. I'm not going to tell you this. Oh, it was such, oh, I should never have done that. Oh, it was like junkie instructor, junkie project, junkie, junkie. And I hated it. And I should have just stopped. And said, okay. But then I said, nah, just stick it out. Just use those stupid, oh, it sucked balls. Oh, I hated it so much. And so... At the end of the year, you know, all right, so then we just, I would have had so much other work from the senior year, but I just had a little bit of work from there, and that's when I just started, when, you know, after I graduated, then mm -hmm. I just started photographing and just trying to do other things until I, yeah. you know, go to Greece. So it was just a matter of building a portfolio, trying to go shoot, trying to get some type of money to do something, whether it was going to be photojournalism at that point because then you're allowed to go out and shoot mm -hmm. and you can shoot whatever boom and then right. you know the things that you like you can have yourself and where however it was going to however we were going to or I was going to be able to make a living and I didn't want to do weddings I didn't want to do studio stuff I didn't want to do any of that and uh, well, that was yeah just to try it that way but it didn't work yeah. And so. so then what kind of um, photographic jobs then did you have after that? I did, yeah, I didn't want to do weddings. I did weddings, but I did them for free. Oh. <laughs> and they were all my friends and everything. So, and my and relatives and I would just, you know, they, you know, you're my relative. Mm -hmm. This would be my gift to you. So I would photograph their weddings for free and everything. And, I didn't really, uh, did, did, I didn't make any money in photography. I was just working and shooting wherever, whenever I could shoot mm -hmm. and just process the film in my darkroom and just print things that I would think would work well. And, uh, and that's what I would do this, that, that whole time. It was more of a, uh, like a part-time thing. Right. Because of, I had businesses to take care of mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, bills to pay and all that kind of stuff. So, so then it became, you know, it became a hobby, mm -hmm. but it's more of a hobby because I, you know, I trained it and I tried to, to pursue it in a more of a, uh, you know, in a bigger way than just being a hobby. Exactly. But at the end, that's what it is. Yeah. And so, you know, obviously I made a, a movie about yeah, and then these are the things that we, if you want to talk about the other aspect of it, yeah we can do that whenever you want so yeah cool that, that's that's the next step yeah well that's actually next on my list is to talk about the films more uh -huh. so today about um because i do want to get in deeper to um your documentary but i mm -hmm. do want to talk about how you got into the world of cinematography and like the film industry? Mm -hmm. Like, how did how did that begin? Okay, um, so we graduate. I wanted to do my Greek thing. Uh, Bob went to um, uh, Maryland, uh, okay. D.C. Mike went to New York City. He started shooting studio work, and he was really good at it. First, he was. A uh, 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 not a PA. What do you call it? an assistant? An assistant. <laughs> so, oh, he's a good assistant. And then he uh, he became a good uh, you know studio photographer until digital killed him. But he, he had a, oh, you wouldn't believe the studio that he had in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was giant, like two thousand square feet, and he it was rent control, so he had it for years and years until he wow. finally got bought out. Oh, it was great. So even when he uh, even when the photography ended. You know, he still had that place until they had to buy him out. But but he did well in in, in studio. Bob went to to uh, Maryland and he was photographing. They're great photographs. He's another. He's so stupid though. He lost it. All his photographs, all his negatives are thrown out. No. He left it to some place and. <laughs> what a 
what an idiot. And boom, <laughs> they tossed him out and they threw him out. So he only has a few prints of all his work. He's one of my favorite. Like a, like a Paula Bronstein, that's how Manganelli's photographs are. That's mm. uh, a fool. So he, made, he decided to go to film school. So then he goes to film school um, to UCLA. He gets in there. I'm doing the, uh, you know, the garage. I did my Greek stuff and everything. I did my mother, and, I, and then I went. I was uh, uh, working at the garage, and then um, what happens back in uh, huh, yeah, nine, around '94, '95, Mike Salori is getting married. So he wants Mike and I to document his wedding as a wedding, you know, black and white, boom, 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 boom. And he wants Bob to do a Super 8 thing over there because now he's in film school. So he gets us all together in New York City, boom. And we're shooting and we're doing this and everything. Now Bob gets a big old head at that point because at UCLA, he was the top student there. He won all these awards. And he went to the Sundance Institute. I don't know if you know what the Sundance yeah. Institute mm-hmm. is. He got accepted for his screenplay. Well, his uh, his short films were put inside there, and, okay. and his short films were very good, very good short films. And he was in the New York Times uh, article. You know, here's Banging Only and Sundance, and they're quoting him and everything about him. And he was an up and coming guy at that point, just like a year or two before was Tarantino. Mm. And his Reservoir Dogs was workshopped at Sundance, just like Bob was doing his script. Oh, awesome. So then he was able to make that, then he did all his other things. So now Bob was over there at Sundance. And so uh, I didn't know what, I, at that point, I didn't know what the hell Sundance was. But we're shooting, we're talking, we're staying in Mike's apartment. Bob, 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 things happen. Bob is, you know, full of himself. He and I almost get into a fist fight over there. It was stupid, but we always get into a fist fight. And get so I didn't want anything to do with him, so I leave. Um, and so his brother was going to finance his film. But his, and, well, I'm sorry, his brother... Uh, with all his money, when you go to Los Angeles, you'd always find a bunch of prostitutes and, uh, and cocaine. Mm. So he ended up doing nothing. So here was Bob, who's going to be this big producer, you know, a, a filmmaker and everything. Off, whatever you want, I'll tell you about those stories also. <laughs> so and then finally, about 1996, because we're moving from one garage to the other garage. Mm-hmm. And then right before the move, I said, you know, let me just call him Bob to see what the heck's happening with him. So I call him up, and he's down in the dumps because his brother wasn't financing his film. <laughs> he was doing cocaine and prostitutes. <laughs> so, so then I said, okay, come on over. I brought him over here, and then I said, let me see if, what I can do. So I wasn't really thinking of finding I thought maybe I can get some money together to do it. Anyways, so that's how the ball started rolling. Right. Uh, I said... All right, let me. I started raising money from people that I know. I said, okay, this is what we got to do. Because I knew if you get, if you make this movie, if you make the movie, I know we're going to be able to exhibit it at Sundance. And people are dying to get into it. I didn't know about that, but Sundance was the premier festival in the United States. Just like the Cannes Festival is in Europe, Sundance is in the United States. And so if you get in that thing, I mean, it's a big time. And yeah. so we already had a foot there. So I did the mathematics in my head. All right, this is a thing. Yeah, if you have that, I know we'll get in there. So then I just put all my time and effort. I said, okay, Bob, I'll try to, to raise the money for your movie. So it's a long story. It's a lot of detail on how you did it. But I was able to raise $333,000. Boom, we're able to go all to these actors to try to get actors. Because in order to make a movie, you need money and talent. You can't mm-hmm. get talent without money, and you can't get money without a talent. So p- try to put all that together. and It's such a pain in the neck. And so finally, finally at the end, um, you know, I'm dealing with William Morris Agency, CCM, I think. ICM, all the big agencies in in Hollywood, 
where you know no one can you need an agent to do that but what we were doing I was sending um, money orders like a hundred thousand dollars money order for an actor like I don't know Willem Dafoe let's say boom and he could cash it then and he'll get another hundred thousand dollars uh, when we do the film mm -hmm. so right now right up front we're giving you a hundred thousand dollars and everything and so we would she'd give him the, the the screenplay and everything and uh, it would be well, no, it's not enough because, you know, he's a million-dollar actor or whatever. But they would send it back. But the whole thing is they would have a bank check for $100,000 in their hand. Now, if they had cashed it, that means, you know, he's got to do it because it's on the contract. Right. But they would send it back. And after a while, you know, we, would, we were sending out $100,000 here and there, here and there. And then all of a sudden, the, the agent, the top agent, they would call me and say, hey, what do you do? No, we can't do that. So I would talk to them. And so at the end, we finally got John Mellencamp. He wanted to do a movie. Right. John Cougar, you know, little diddy, like Jack, and that, that, that idiot. So he was the one that we finally were able to get. Because of him, we were able to raise another $1.4 million. Right. We made the movie. And... At that point, that's when I was working at the garage and doing this, and so it was it was hard. And then so that's how we started to make the movie. And so after that, we went into Sundance. And at Sundance, it was the movie was picked up internationally. All the distributors bought the movie except Germany. I don't know why, but Germany didn't buy the movie. We sold all of Europe, South America, Asia, but Germany didn't buy the Germany. <laughs> so then a couple months later then Miramax bought the North American rights mm. to it so that was good so did you ever hear of RKO Pictures did you ever mm. see let's do the time warp again. what's that the Rocky Horror oh, Picture yeah. Show okay mm -hmm. okay Rocky Horror Picture Show RKO Pictures did that did you ever, in the beginning at the end it's like a it's like an antenna. Do, 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 do. Yeah. You ever see that? Yeah. yeah that's our, we grew up with that because mm -hmm. RKO was an old company. So because we were able to make that movie at $1.4 mm -hmm. $1. million and it looked like a $10 million movie, so they thought, okay, these guys can make small movies. So RKO Pictures contacted us and said, we have this library of work, which we have shot, the really film noirish type of things, you just take them, rewrite them the way that you want, and shoot them. You know, low budget, two million dollars, whatever, like mm -hmm. that. So they were get, you know, it was in my house, and Bob was there, and they were sending us VHSs, you know, so, and we were watching all these movies, and he didn't want to do any of them. Yeah. Bob, <laughs> so he didn't want to do any of them, and so we ended up not doing them. He ended up going to Ecuador, doing ayahuasca and with the shamans. And he comes back and he writes a screenplay. We almost were able to make a $15 million movie, but that mm -hmm. fell apart. Did you ever see the movie uh, Memento? Mm -hmm. Guy Pierce, the actor there. We had him, but then they all fell apart. And then, mm -hmm. So then I got a book deal from somebody Wrote, write this, Bob. He would write it. This other guy wrote it. That he didn't want to do. That fell apart. <laughs> and so, then Bob will make the movie. He doesn't want. So then, finally, I said, "Okay." At the end, I said, "I'll make a movie. I'll make a movie. I'll make a documentary." So, I told Bob, he got into some money. There, I'll put in this money. You put in this. We'll both make this movie because it'll be. You're learning how to bow hunt. But you're a photographer, and you'll have some. And then I'm a bow hunter, and I'm a photographer also. And then we'll, oh, just the interaction between he and I, and the shooting and everything. And it would have been so much better. It would have been. It, and he would. I would. Have, I put about twenty thousand. He would have put mm -hmm. twenty thousand. So just that alone would have given us a better production value and everything. We would have had more. But he didn't want to do it. And then his son committed suicide, and that's the whole different story over there. And so that was the film quest. In between there is when we opened up Dogtown also, and I'm trying to make 
these movies mm -hmm. while working a dog kind of one movie after another after another and I was able to uh, another kid made another kid wanted to make a movie uh, and he needed a producer so he brought me on board as a producer and we finished it it was three it's not such a great movie but he wanted to do it and uh, so I helped him and uh, so I have so I did three okay and, and actually I did a little music video Oh, cool. A Greek music video <laughs> for, I had a budget of $1,000, so I brought it in at $500, <laughs> and I made a little Greek video, That's Greek awesome. music video on that, <laughs> so that was that. That's funny. So is that second, or the third movie you're talking about, 3.14? That's the second one. That's, okay, okay. The Blue White Tail is uh, the third one. The third one, one. okay. Made. Okay. And so were you what they call like a produ a producer on producer. those two movies? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's I guess a, you did tell me it, what that yeah, entails. And it's, yeah, and it's a product. Now, I had an argument with my friend John Vincent over what is an executive producer and a producer. If you have the money for the film, you can do whatever you want. You can have any type of title that you want. Mm -hmm. But as a producer... So when you look at your movie, the next time you're sitting in your, uh, you know, watching your movie or whatever it is, <clears throat> for a producer, the top credit mm -hmm. comes right before the director. So as, you know, in the beginning of the, I mean, they've changed them all around, but if you, in the beginning of the movie, you see the credits, you know, cinematographer, production designer, editor, screenplay written by, then you have associate producer, executive producer, right. boom. So the produce, the producerial credit produced by, boom, that comes right at the end, because at the end of the title sequence, it's directed by. Mm -hmm. The directed by is the last credit on the film when you show it like that. And in your, um, in your, in your what do you call it, in your advertising. So the producer that is the closest to the director that is the top producer. Okay. So because Whitetail Images was my production company that mm -hmm. financed everything in the beginning, and then I brought on another producer, John Coca, so we could produce. And we're, making, we're actually making the film. Now I found the money people. The actual person that put in the $1.4 million, his name is Robert Sturm. Aaron Rifkin, he was a big executive for William Morris. He was partners with John Mellencamp. He, Rifkin brought in the talent. Sturm brought in the money. I gave them executive producer credits. Okay. They weren't, you know, the nuts and bolts in making the movies. Mm -hmm. They gave us the big things. Now, if they, want, if they said, well, we're going to be the producers over here. We want those things. Well, then we would have had an impasse. We said, well, you can't because... You're not going to be doing this. Yes, I know it's your money and everything like this. So at the end of the, if it was either to take this or not, we mm -hmm. would have given it to them. Right. But that is the producer. So there's so many other ways of producer. Our uh, assistant director, very important in the film. And this guy, without him, I don't know if we would have been able to make the movie. He's a great guy, Van Hayden. He was our uh, assistant director, but I gave him an associate producer's credit also because he was so valuable. Mm -hmm. Katie Papp is over here. She saved the production. Our production coordinator left the day before production, and we didn't have anybody. And a production coordinator, you needed somebody smart over there, and the smartest person we knew was Katie. So we brought in her to, uh, to do it. Bob, when she came into the office, she said she would do it. He fell on his feet, and he was like <laughs> worshiping her and everything like that. So she got an associate producer credit. Tony Schilacci, who who was the co-writer with Bob, he came in, wasn't getting paid, but he was helping Bob with the writing. Because as you're going, you're always changing dialogue and things like that. I gave him an associate producer credit also. And that's how you give credits out. That's what a producer okay. does. Okay, that makes so, sense. So all these other things, then you have a production uh, uh, coordinator, you have... Um, a line producer, which is a producer on the set with the with the assistant director, and he makes sure he's like a manager, makes sure everything goes out. Didn't have money for that, so I was that too, because it was like running a business. You know, I, 
we need this thing over here and you, know, you guys do that. So I would have to be a line producer also. But at the end, because I'm, cause it's my film and I make it, I'm doing the craft service. I'm doing the security for the, uh, for, uh, for, you know, overnight watching the trailers and everything. I'm doing the, you know, I got to get the crafts, the, the, the food for the catering, you know, doing, and you're just doing about a million type of things. Mm -hmm. So that's a, produ I'm producing the movie. Right. It's my thing. So that's why John Coca and I, because we were the nuts and bolts and put everything together, we got the big producer credit right before the director. Okay, I see. It, it's weird. And it's stupid, but <laughs> that's, yeah. but that's how they that's like the hierarchy in the totem pole of Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Um, and Katie, I just want to mention. So it's in here. Uh -huh. Katie, your wife, wife, correct? No, Katie's not my wife. Katie's not She's your wife. She's my friend over here. Oh. The other, yeah. What's Anastasia is my wife. She's in Greece. Oh. Big long story. Okay, no, it's pro no problem. Okay, big long story. But Katie, she, I, she, she came down with cancer. So, I helped her mm -hmm. here. I had this. <laughs> it's a long story. No, that's okay. Because, that's no, because okay. my wife and my kids they went to Greece. Right. Okay. Over there to. Um, because I was doing the movie, mm -hmm. we just started Dogtown, so I was working over 100 hours a week and wow. trying to make another movie and everything like this. So my wife, she always oh, agrees. Uh, she, always, she was always going back and forth in the summer because mm -hmm. I had a lot of money because of the repair shop. So I always, yeah, go, 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 go. Yeah. And she always, and when the kids were born, she always wanted to have the kids um, uh, uh, go to Greece for a year to stay over there. So when we were doing Dogtown in the movie, she said, listen, you're, gonna, you're hardly home. Let us just go for a year yeah. in Greece, you know, so they can have the, the culture, the thing and everything. Because like we have it here, but it's different there. And, you know, they have cousins and everything over there mm -hmm. from her side of the family also. I said, all right, go for the year. So we went for a year, and this is what pisses me off. This is during the, the uh, 98, 99 the uh, 97, not 97, what am I talking about? 2008, 2009, oh. the housing crisis, mm -hmm. you know, where, where uh, the banking crisis, where you had TARP and they, and we, the taxpayer, paid for Goldman Sachs and everyone to, to, to bail them all out and everything. It was the bubble, it was a housing bubble. She bought a house over there. My cousin co signed it without me knowing any of that mm -hmm. stuff co-signed that and everything like that and uh then when they're supposed to come home is it no no we bought a house at, what are you crazy now i have my house in henrietta and i'm working so i was just gonna let them fail because who's gonna pay the bill and everything but then i knew if that happens they got to come back and i'm oh, and i'm gonna get a divorce if that's gonna happen it's gonna be the biggest pain in the neck so I said all right I can't do that so as I'm working I'm paying for that house and my house mm -hmm. and I can't do it it's, it's just too much money and so Katie gets cancer again well she had that and then she comes back home and she has to I mean, she had a big, and then she has to do it all over again, yeah. and then she has to go through chemotherapy and bring the chemotherapy at the house. So, oh, wow. so now her father set up the institute in in uh, South Carolina. He's he well, he was the uh, head of his department at NIH. Then when they broke, it split apart, and they went to do something else. He set up the institute in South Carolina, and so he brought on a, a lot of great. Uh, uh, scientists and surgeons and so her colon cancer that she mm -hmm. had the surgeon over there was one of the top surgeons and they have a house over there so she went and she lived over with her mother and her mother took care of her for the whole time boom, boom. and she comes back over here and they check again and it's back mm -hmm. so now she has to do all this stuff and do the chemotherapy so instead of her going back over there I went well I can take care of you over yeah. here because I already did that before mm -hmm and everything right. so so I helped her out over here so I said okay then I'll sell my house because I can't 
do both over there. So meanwhile, while that happened, my wife got cancer over there. Oh my God. So now you have socialized medicine, which is the worst. <laughs> you know, I mean, you stand in line and you'll never get treatment. It just that's just how it is. No one understands what happens if everything is for free. You got a big line over there, and you don't have people right. taking care of you. But over, it's different in Canada. They don't allow this. In Canada, they have a big socialized system, and everyone's on a waiting list. That's why they come to the United States to get surgery done, and everything. They pay yeah. it for themselves. In Greece, it's the same thing. If you want to go to the hospital, do all that, you got to wait and wait, and people die of cancer that way. So what happens is you go to a private entity that will take care of you, and they, they're so much better. So, so that house, all that money went to give her the uh, uh, the cancer treatments and everything over here. Mm -hmm. So now I don't have a house. So I stay over here. I'm working over here. I take care of Katie. So then the kids grow up over there. Uh, my daughter goes to school, so I'm paying for the school to go over there. Boom, boom, she goes to school, everything over there. She loves it over there. She wants to stay with my son. He wanted, he wanted to come here. You know, I don't want to stay over here. So he comes over here. The only thing is, he's got to go to the Army because he was registered, even though he's born here, he was registered as a Greek oh. citizen. Now, he's got to go to the Army. He's got to be a Greek soldier. <laughs> oh, boy. And that's the... That's the uh, the uh, the nuts and bolts of what happened in in a small, short, succinct way. Okay, that makes sense. So now, your kid, but do both your kids live in Greece? No, still? Achilles is Just, here. Okay. And Alexander and your is, over is there. there. Okay. Okay. And Katie, I knew her from the repair garage. Okay. Because she was getting her master's degree at the U of R, and. Uh, she just needed some work to be done. I kind of she looked at the phone book and she saw naked. She saw we had a pretty good logo and we might be Greek. So she came over there and that's how we met Katie. And nice. then when I found out that she was, a, you know, postmodern American poetry, all that, but it was going to be a PhD thing and she was going to go move over a PhD, I would give her, here, read Bob's screenplay. What do you think over there? And so. And so, so we started the whole production over there. I brought her on board to help out, and she would type and she would do stuff what she could for the movie. Because our production office was in the repair garage. Yeah. And I had so many people coming in, volunteers helping and doing this and doing this, trying to get a movie done. So it was... And then she became good friends with, my, with Fran and Peggy, my brother-in-law, mm. and, and she would always go over there. John Coker would always come. Johnny Miko, everyone would come. We had so many volunteers coming, and we almost went into, you know, had a star to get into production every a couple times. So we're always shifting and doing things, and this is just stupid independent filmmaking and everything. And finally, it's done. And you, oh, good. and at that point, Katie, she got pissed at Bob, and everything. the guy's a, he's a loser. He's stupid. So she don't even bother me. So she leaves and everything like that. Now we need. Oh shoot, who's going to take? Who's going to do the production coordinating and everything? We don't have a production coordinator now because she left right before we're going to start shooting. And, and then and the boss says, I mean, it's got to be Katie. She's the only smart one that we know that can do that. <laughs> you got to ask her. I said, oh, she's going to kill me. I can't ask. You got to ask her. So I went to the library, you know, with the tail between. Yeah. Could you? <laughs> And so she comes and she does it. <laughs> she saved Perfect. the production. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's where we'll leave it today. And then next time we can start off by talking about the blue white tail and okay. photographic processes and stuff. No, no but problem. yeah, that's for today.